Now, I came on here after game one of the 2014 NBA Finals and did a video entitled LeBron's Leg Cramp Equals ESPN's Menstrual Cramps, and I'll put the link to that video in the description box down below. And I think some people failed to grasp the major point that I was getting at. It was not so much a LeBron bash piece as it was a bash piece against ESPN and the pro-LeBron agenda and the pro-LeBron propaganda coming from the NBA and the basketball sports media. That's what that video was all about. Now, you know, with all the questions about LeBron and his cramping after game one, you know, all the LeBron haters and kind of the indifferent LeBron people had their fun at the expense of the LeBron marks or the LeBron fans and the LeBron ass kissers. So it didn't surprise me in game two when LeBron did play a lot better. He showed up, his team showed up, and they found a way to win a game that they maybe frankly should have lost, that the social media world exploded, and now it was back to LeBron love, and this is what we were talking about, and, da, 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 and he is the greatest, and oh my God, he's just like Jordan, and all of you haters can suck it now. The Heat are just fine. Yeah. So you knew those people were going to have their moment in the sun. And that now that after game two, the Heat had won a game in San Antonio, as Pat Riley once said, a series doesn't really begin until a road team wins a game. Then when home court advantage is lost, that's when the series really begins. Well, we saw the series really begin in game three, and we saw the San Antonio Spurs completely dominate. I came on here after game three and talked about the fact that the San Antonio Spurs needed to learn from what they saw in the first three games and understand that if they made the necessary changes, that they can win this year's NBA Finals. And if they made those necessary changes, I saw some indications that they might be able to win it as soon as in five games, because I was starting to notice that maybe the Miami Heat were getting ready to kind of cave a little bit. And the Spurs were starting to demonstrate just how superior of an all-around team they truly were. And then last night, Game 4, of the 2014 NBA Finals happens. And, you know, as I'm sitting there watching the game, I see the Spurs do some of the things that I'm talking about. They didn't go to the lengths that I talked about necessarily, but they clearly understand that their way to win this series is not on the defensive side of the ball. Like so many head coaches always believe that's the key. Like so many in the basketball media want to talk about and sit there and talk about. The San Antonio Spurs understand in my opinion, especially after seeing their performance in Game 4, again, that they will win this NBA Final Series, and they're going to win it. And they might win it in Game 5 on Sunday night. I'd be surprised if they didn't via the offensive side. Their offense and the Heat's inability to combat their offense, and in particular, their superior depth, their superior three-point shooting, and their ability with so many different guys on the floor at any given time, to be able to create a penetration off of the dribble drive and create quality open shots for either themselves or others that you know the Heat were going to be in a world of trouble because they just can't match up. And you saw that play out again in Game 4. But my bigger question now is, as we head towards Game 5 Sunday night in San Antonio, is have the Miami Heat accepted their fate? Have they come to grips with the fact that they're not going to win this series this year? And has this team quit? And in particular, has LeBron James quit on the Miami Heat? As I was watching game four, you know, the first half goes along and the Spurs are playing very well. The Miami Heat are not. You know, the top players for Miami aren't playing well. Wade is non-existent. LeBron is pretty much non-existent. And the Spurs go into halftime just like in game three with a freaking monster lead. And the Heat have such an incredible hill to climb. But then here comes LeBron. He puts up 19 points in the third quarter. At one point in time, he seemed to be interested. He seemed like he wanted to will his team to victory. And then by the time he got to the fourth quarter, he kind of disappeared. He didn't score any points. And the Miami Heat literally looked like they had mentally caved. They had quit. And it seems like they are just willing to accept their fate, accept their beating, and look forward to going fishing in the offseason. And part of my complaint about LeBron James from time to time <clears throat> is not that people view him as the best player in the NBA, because I think he is, and I think that is unquestioned. Not that he is 
viewed as perhaps an all-time great player, because again, I think you could start to make that argument that he is. My problem with him is that he is put on a certain pedestal, and that any negatives or any legitimate critiques or criticisms about him are instantly cast aside as being hating or as being trolling or as being f unfounded accusations, what have you. And I think a lot of these things indeed are actually very legit and very real criticisms to have. Like people want to talk about LeBron James being such a great leader and such a great champion that he would never quit on his team and that he has such an incredible mental aptitude for the game of basketball. Well, then where was that mental aptitude in game number four? LeBron had to know after the blowout loss in game number three that he had to be the leader. And as the team leader in the NBA, you have to understand, as Jordan once said, that you fill a utility role. Whatever your team needs on a given night, you give them. If your team needs you to get 20 rebounds and 15 assists, then that's what you need to get. If your team needs you to get 20 points, 10 boards, 8 assists, then that's what you need to give. Too often when it comes to LeBron James, people get caught up in the statistical bullshit to automatically talk about his awesomeness. They sit there and say, well, he had 25 points, he had 15 rebounds, he had 9 assists. That was great. You can't blame LeBron. No, at some point in time you can. Because it's not always what you do. It's how you do it, and in particularly, and especially in the NBA Finals, sometimes most importantly, when you do it. Like, if you look at LeBron James's stat line from Game 4, you see 28 points on the board, and you're sitting there and saying, well, he played well. LeBron did everything he could do to possibly win if you just looked at the stats. But if you watched that game and you saw the fact that he was a non-factor the entire first half as the San Antonio Spurs were building a yet again insurmountable lead, and he only had nine points at the half and was really a non-factor, a very passive player at a time where he needed to be the aggressor. He needed to force the issue. He needed to say, this team is either going to ride on my back or I'm going to die trying. And I am going to impose my will on this game, on the opposing team, and on this series. And whatever happens, happens. Instead, he was passing the ball. He was moving without the ball. That you sit there and will say, well, that's great. No, it's not. At some point in time, your alpha male needs to be the alpha male. And there have been too many times over the years where I've seen LeBron fail to understand this. That his team didn't need that 19 points in the third quarter of game number four. They needed that 19 points in the first quarter of game number one, or three, excuse me, or four. They needed that 19 points in the first quarter. They needed LeBron to come out and set the tone. They needed LeBron to come out and be the aggressor. They needed be LeBron to be the leader that said, you either come with me or you don't, but I'm going along and I'm going to make this a fucking game and I'm going to get us back in this damn series. And then you get to the fourth quarter, he has 28 points at the start of the fourth quarter and doesn't score again the rest of the game. Here he is passing off the ball, and he's just kind of standing around like he doesn't really seem to care. His defensive effort lacked tremendously, and then he was more than willing to go sit on the bench and watch the last few minutes of the game. And as I looked at him, I said, is history repeating itself again? Is this guy quitting on this team? For all the people that say, after game one, well, LeBron can't be a quitter. He's a two-time NBA champion. Do we forget what happened in his last game with Cleveland in the 2010 Eastern Conference playoffs? Do we remember that shitty performance in his last game for Cleveland where he flat out looked like he did not give a shit, he did not give a fuck, and he just gave up, and he said, that's it, I'm done, I am out of here? We're supposed to forget that. We're supposed to forget his performances in the 2007 NBA Finals where he had dominated to get the team to that point. And then once he got there, he mentally caved. Are we supposed to get forget the 2011 NBA Finals where largely, again, he had occasional flashes of dominating and taking over, but far too often was far too passive, far too unselfish, and far too unwilling to step up to the plate and ultimately, just like the rest of his team, kind of mentally caved and imploded and quit. 
That's what I see going on here again. This whole notion that a champion can't be a quitter is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Because if you watch the Miami Heat right now, this looks like a team that is mentally conceited. This looks like a team that is quit. And when their leader looks like the biggest quitter of all, that he is mentally caved and conceited, and he looks like he is ready to leave Miami. He looks like he is willing to get out of Miami. It looks like he understands that they had their time, their time is done, and he can't do anything to change it, so why bother? That's exactly what it looks like to me. Like I said, game four, he needed to be the aggressor from the very beginning. Now, after the first half, where he wasn't the aggressor and he allowed the Spurs to build this huge lead in part because he failed as the utility player, he failed as the leader, he failed as the best player in the NBA, he comes up and basically put up 19 meaningless points in the third quarter to pad the old stat line that so many people always like to point to when they reference LeBron's greatness. It's ridiculous. Like, I don't want to point, put this as bluntly and obviously as I possibly can. Because anybody that has watched most, if not all four of the games in this 2014 NBA Finals series so far, understands that clearly the series MVP is Boris Diaw. Boris Diaw has had more impact on this series. Boris Diaw has been a better all-around player in this series than a freaking LeBron James. Now, some of you are going to point to LeBron's points that he scored, and the this and the that, and it's all a bunch of bullshit. Believe it. When you look at impact, when you look at meaning, when you look at significance to his team in this series, consistently showing up, doing what his team needs him to do, when he needs to do it, and how he needs to do it, Boris Diaw has been a much better all-around player in this final series than LeBron James. And believe me, I thought that was something I was never going to say about a starting-to-get-gray-hair, fat-ass Boris Diaw. When a Boris Diaw is playing with more mental toughness, when a Boris Diaw is being more aggressive than the so-called best player in the world, there's a problem here. I fully expect the Miami Heat to go down to San Antonio in Game 5, maybe put up a fight for a couple of quarters, and then ultimately mentally cave, collapse, and just quit. LeBron James needs to understand that these type of things will ultimately define his legacy. They will ultimately define his greatness. If he doesn't come out in game five and shoot the ball 15 times in the first half, or at least 12 times in the first half, then they might as well bench him, and they might as well just totally throw in the towel. This whole notion of his greatness of being an unselfish player and being a facilitator, that doesn't always make him a great player. In fact, sometimes people, I emphasize this again, that can work to the disadvantage of both him and his team. He must understand, and you must understand, that at times, if you are the big dog, if you are the alpha male, you must be the alpha male. Do not be concerned about 25 points and 12 rebounds and 8 assists. If your team needs 40 points out of you, and they need 20 to 25 of them to come in the first half, then you give that team 25 points, and you put up 45 or 50. You don't stop. You don't stop attacking. You don't stop being aggressive. And far too often throughout this whole series, and in particular in Game 4, I saw LeBron James be so passive to the point where I fully believe that he has quit and that he is done with this Miami Heat organization, and he is ready to move on, and he has conceded that his team will not win another game in this series. That might be hard for some of you to accept. Some of you might not choose to believe that. But I'm sorry, based off of what I've seen throughout this series, and in particular Game 4, I think that is an indisputable, undeniable fact. LeBron James has quit on Miami. LeBron James is a quitter. Just because he is a champion doesn't mean he still can't be a quitter because after watching Game 4 and watching this series, how can you argue otherwise?